as you look out rest of this year into 2024, um, are the people that are saying, um, hey, forget soft landing, we're going to have no landing, right? We, the, we, we've, we, we've finessed this and, and we've avoided a, a recession. Uh, are they going to be proven right or wrong in your opinion? Wrong in my opinion. Okay. Uh, and do you believe that the lag effects are real and are, 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 are going to increasingly express themselves here? Or is there a different reason why you, you, you think uh, recession is inevitable? No, I think it's I think oil is going to get a lot higher. And I think sooner or later, commercial real estate is going to have to be dealt with. Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Wealthion founder Adam Taggart. Thanks for joining us for part two of our interview with macro analyst Luke Groman. If you haven't yet watched part one of our discussion with Luke, in which he details why he calculates the U.S. is in the final innings of a sovereign debt crisis that will upend much of the status quo as we know it, head over to our channel at youtube.com slash Wealthian and watch it there first. It sets the context for the investment themes we discuss in this video. Okay, let's get started watching part two of our interview with Luke Groman. For a long, long time, dollars equal energy, Do you know, treasuries equal energy. And we are seeing in real time the disconnection between the dollar and energy and treasuries and energy. Uh, you're seeing people circumvent that, right? When China says, hey, we just signed a 27 year LNG deal with the UAE or uh, with Qatar, excuse me. And then they sign a second one. Like the way the world worked from 19, geez, 1971 at least up until recently was China sells crap to the US, US sends dollars, China takes the dollars, they buy treasuries and they hold those treasuries for a rainy day when they need to buy LNG. Right. Now what are they doing? They're going straight to the source and going, here, you take the dollars and you promise us we will pre-buy a 27-year supply of LNG. And then we'll do it again because we would rather own a 27-year supply of LNG in the ground than we would the equivalent amount of treasuries. They're telling you what's happening. Yeah. People just refuse to see it. And that then flips over. Well, who buys those treasuries? Fed, banks. Well, who buys them if the Fed and the banks don't? Nobody. The rates go up until we figure out who's going to buy them. Right. And we hope that the, that rate, that clearing rate, doesn't bankrupt the U.S. government. Oops, receipts are below true, true interest expense already. So we're, that's why I would say we're on the seventh, eighth end. So do you see us then... Um... Is the Japanification of the U.S. inevitable at this point? <laughs> Do yeah, but it's gonna yeah. The Japanification of the U.S. is gonna feel like the Argentinaization. Twin deficit nations like the U.S. when they go Japan, they don't get deflation; they get severe inflation. Right. So you think about Japan. You know, setting aside that we provided Japan's defense for them for that entire time, so they don't have to print the money to pay defense. Yeah. Setting aside that they are culturally largely homogeneous, uh, hom homogeneous, which has uh, uh, makes the politics of what has happened to Japan much easier to weather. Let's just look at the straight economics, which are the, Japan runs a current account surplus, and Japan has a net international investment position of sixty uh, percent, give or take, of GDP to the positive. The positive, which means they have savings equal to um, you know sixty percent of GDP offshore. So Japan can run deflation. Um, you're running current account surpluses. Worst case, you've got this net international investment position piggy bank. You know they could sell three percent of that per year and finance their deficits for 20 years, assuming no growth in returns. They earn a 3% return on that. They can do it almost in perpetuity. Let's look at the United States. Twin deficits, net ne negative net international investment position, right? So we can't run deflation because deflation is a positive real interest rate for that, right? That as, a, as having positive assets in Japan, deflation means they're getting positive real rates of return. They can do that all friggin' day long. They can do it for years. They can do it for 30 years, as we've seen. U.S. can't do that for more than three months, six months. We've already seen why. 
because tax receipts fall. And unlike Japan, we don't have a piggy bank offshore to repatriate. There is no piggy bank. The piggy bank is the Fed. The piggy bank is the Fed printing the money because foreigners have the assets here. So what's going to happen? Yeah, we can have deflation for like that long. And then the banks have a problem or, or foreigners repatriate their assets. You know, we have deflation. The dollar goes up. Foreigners start selling the 18 trillion they have. Rates go up. Rates go up. And they go up and up until they hit a rate where the U.S. government can't afford it. And then we go to Japan and go, well, let's just repatriate the net. Oh, we don't have a net international investment position. In fact, because the dollar is so strong, foreigners are pulling their assets home to finance their their dollar debt. We don't have it. What do we do? Jerome Powell. He prints the difference. Okay. So we're, we're going to go a little bit long here. If you can I, <laughs> I will try to be brief as I can, because um, because I, I do have a bunch of specific questions. I know folks want your, your feedback on we'll consider that kind of a lightning round that we're coming up to. But real quick on this point. Um, so the Ar Argentinaification of America, if it indeed goes that route, and as you're saying, we're in the seventh or eighth inning here. So, you know, you're, you're presumably it's not going to be too long before we, we find out how this ends, right? Um, we've got a huge part of the populace that is hanging on, you know, by their financial fingernails here, right? I mean, we, we've had this policies to date have rewarded uh, the already wealthy, right? And if we get into an Argentina-like scenario where the purchasing power of the, the currency really starts tanking hard, um, I mean, presumably the people who own financial assets, as long as those financial assets are inflating in price, commensurate with the, the purchasing power decline in the dollar, they're going to be okay. But again, that's the wealthy, right? How does the average guy not get screwed here? Because you, you mentioned earlier, you were seeing a future where maybe, maybe the scales would shift a little more, you know, uh, back a little bit to a little more fair scenario between the haves and the have-nots. But unless wages increase faster than purchasing power declines, um, I, I don't know. I don't. I don't see how the, the the average guy gets out okay here. And and I'll just wrap this. Uh, question I'm handing to you in, in the, the wrapper of, I put a video on this channel about a week ago or so, um, reacting to the, the video that just came out. I don't know if you saw it, but the, the North men north of Richmond, um, mm -hmm. kind of, you know, uh, angry ode to the plight of the working class. You know, I think we're already beginning to see signs of fracture in the social fabric where, mm -hmm you know, the, not necessarily even the middle class, but just the working class, the people that, that are still doing their best to make a living and make this country run are kind of getting to the like, screw it stage, right? Um, so I guess where I'm kind of going with this is, is does the Argentinaification of, of the economy, does that also include some sort of social uprising or upheaval here as, as the, the masses get to a point where they just can't get by anymore. Look, I mean, when you do dumb things for a long time on borrowed money, sooner or later, a reckoning comes. And the reckoning's here. And the trigger, again, in my view, is oil. Once the oil starts, once oil rolls over, that's the destabilizing thing. They can paper over a lot of stuff. They can't paper over six dollars a gallon at the corner at the corner gas station. So let me turn the question around and give us our options. Either the feds, you know, there's, there's, if we want to stop inflation, we have to slash fiscal. That's it. Okay, so there's only three things you can cut. Treasury spending, you got to cut rates, which is inflationary. Okay, so we can rule that out. Or you need to cut entitlements and defense by 40 to 60% immediately, permanently. All right. Which no politician will do unless absolutely last. So, option. yeah, tell me, tell me, tell me what's what's you know, if the pop is is the is the populace going to be in any better a mood if we cut entitlements by forty to sixty percent overnight and and leave them there? No. Um, and and oh by the way, 
when you if you did that, the reverberation of that would collapse the banks, it would collapse the treasury market, it would collapse global asset markets. Um, <laughs> because again, you're talking about uh, let's say you, you want to stop the inflation, you got to get an eight percent deficit of GDP back to two. All right, you got to cut six points of GDP tomorrow permanently. Okay, great, right? Because unemployment's at three and a half. We're at like peak of the cycle, so you got to cut six points of GDP. The great financial crisis, GDP fell what on a full year basis four. That collapsed. That almost collapsed the system. You're done. COVID. COVID was an 8% decline in GDP, if I remember right, maybe nine on an annualized basis. You're going to cut it six forever? You're done. You're done. That's the thing that people don't get. You can't, there's no out. They're done. You can't cut six points of GDP. The system collapses. And so now what do you want to do? You want to stand aside and let the banks fail, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? Okay, good luck. That's why I say it's not a dial anymore. Switch. Argentina? Right, but, it sounds, but it's but it's sounding increasingly, at least to me, uh, as it's a switch of death by fire or death by ice. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, like, it's, it's, it's always been that. But again, it's this is why I always say, listen, we need an economic or an energy productivity miracle. We need an energy productivity miracle. It is, you know, fusion, small fission, these UAPs, whatever the hell they are. If there's some sort of technology here that can be commercialized rapidly, something that drives a productivity increase. There are other productivity increases. They're not pleasant, but but you can get out of this. Um, look, if we overthrow Putin and get complete control of all of his all of his resources and we sell them cheap, that's a productivity miracle. If the baby boom generation um, you know, passes on over the next five years and passes their assets, you know, quickly and passes all their 65 trillion in wealth to their kids. So that we get rid of the entitlement basically over a span of three to five years while the kids boom economic growth because it's like a lottery ticket when the wealth shows up in their inbox. That's a productivity miracle. These are things like there are ways out of this. Um, they're extremely they're, they become more unlikely by the day. So then <laughs> okay. your choice is inflation. Or collapse. You can't cut six points of deficit without collapsing this. That's the part people want to go. Well, let, let's just well, let's raise taxes. Obama raised taxes. He raised taxes in 2014. It was called Obamacare. The Supreme Court said it was a tax increase. And so let's talk through what happened. We the, the Wall Street Journal in December 2014 said that part of the Obamacare was to push healthcare costs onto consumers, thereby lowering U.S. government deficits. Great. A tax increase. By the middle of 2016, the U.S. deficit as a percent of GDP was actually rising as a result of attempts to make it shrink relative to GDP because pushing the cost off balance sheet government on balance sheet consumer reduced consumption, mm -hmm. sent the dollar higher, and sent global borrowing rates higher as they crowded out global dollar markets, and the deficit started rising. Like, there's no fix for this other than productivity miracle or time machine and going back and being an adult back when the Berlin Wall came down and, and readjusting things on the back half of that. Right. You need that's it. Those are your happy endings. But both of those being unlikely, right? Yeah. So um it's like I said, sunshine and roses. Um I'm also <laughs> I'm also laughing at the uh we have a lot of boomers and the viewers here, and uh I I know you were just theorizing of ways in which we could we could close our predicament um but yeah oh, absolutely like it's not what angry I'm comments two, about the culling yeah, of the I've, boomer horde yeah <laughs> no I've, I've got you know two boomer parents a boomer mother in law i love them all I, it's it, it you but people say well what are the things you know i frequently get asked what would you need to see that would make you change your view that would be one of them if you told me you know the boomer population has gone from 70 million to 10 million over the next five years and their assets have passed down to their kids, I'm going to be wrong. The economy is going to be booming uh, because it's going to flow to 40-year-old people who are in like peak spending years. GDP is going to be like massive. The Fed's going to have to keep raising rates. Like, like that's, you have to be objective as an analyst, regardless of whether, you know, you, you can't be emotional about the inputs. Right. People ask me what, 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 you know, 
what are the inputs that could make me wrong? That's an input that would make me wrong. Got it. Got it. Okay. Um, so just as we're getting the lightning round here, th there's a comment that was made by uh, a, a financial um, observer God, well over a decade ago, um, a guy named Jim Paplava. And uh, it was back back when oil was, you know, up to $149 a barrel, whatever, right? And he said, you know what? He said, I think oil is the new Fed funds rate, right? That it, It's really the thing that is going to dictate economic growth going forward. And it's out of control of the Fed, right? You know, it's just the, you, you can't print more oil, as you've said many times in this discussion, right? And so I, it seems to me that you're picking up that mantle, right, which is going forward the oil price is going to be much more important than whatever the Fed decides to do, because that's the real world which drives controls economic growth. Yeah, that's that's you know we've said it before. That is nature's discount rate, right? That is there's yeah. a a commentator in the late 1990s um, on the financial uh, boards called another, and he said it's not well understood that the world's assets ever embedded in the price of every asset is a full and growing supply of cheap and cheaper oil, right? Like then what's the value of your house, you know, in an outer suburb, California with no public transport. It has one value at $1 gasoline and at $15 gasoline, the value of your house in a 60 mile outside of LA suburb is a lot lower. Right now that predates work from home, zoom, et cetera, et cetera. Right. There, no, there still, are offsets. But, well. to but but but, you know, but but that that cost of energy is embedded in everything. The what it's it costs to saw the, the lumber, you know, I mean, just everything, right? Yeah, exactly. everything, a everything. So that's that's it's such a big, it's such a big, it's nature's discount rate. Okay, all right, lightning round now. Um, so uh, we talked a little bit earlier about the lag effect um, and uh, how the recession's been pushed off. As you look out rest of this year into twenty twenty four. Are the people that are saying, um, "Hey, forget soft landing. We're going to have no landing." Right? We, the, we we've 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 finessed this and, and we've avoided a, a recession. Uh, are they going to be proven right or wrong in your opinion? Wrong, in my opinion. Okay. Uh, and do you believe that the lag effects are real and are are are, are going to increasingly express themselves here, or is there a different reason why you you, you think uh, recession is inevitable? No, I think it's I think oil is going to get a lot higher. And I think sooner or later, commercial real estate is going to have to be dealt with. OK. Um, OK, so let's let's talk about real estate. I had a question for you here about the housing market. How long can this Mexican standoff sustain um, and in which way do you think it'll be won? Um, I think I know your answer, but I don't want to put words in your mouth. Um, maybe before we go to the retail housing market, maybe we can just talk about how big of a time bomb do you expect commercial real estate to be? It has the potential to be really, really big. Like, um, but again, for me, it's just another metric where the it's a switch. Does the Fed want to let the banking system collapse or does the Fed want to sacrifice the value of the dollar and inflation? And the Fed has given us no, you know, the Fed is particularly in the last several instances, uh, the springs, uh, banking strains, March 2020s off the run treasury market crash and the repo rate spike in 2019 in September. The Fed has been has shown no ability or no willingness to stand aside and just wait. They've become increasingly proactive. So I think I look at the commercial real estate side as you're going to get one big crack and then that's going to force the Fed to do something. That's how I'm thinking of it. And that makes it really tough to trade, right? And I don't know what that crack looks like, right? You get a major, you know, you've already had some uh, gating, but you get some sort of, you know, very headline commercial real estate entity. Um, say, look, we can't refinance however many billions. Here's the keys. Yeah. And just to be clear, we're seeing that already a lot in San Francisco yeah. out near Wyoming. Yeah, that's exactly right. And that's, you know, there's sort of, you know, and, you know, again, I I, you know, I live in Cleveland. So like people think this will, don't, don't worry, this will turn around. Well, maybe. But there's no, <laughs> you know, that's what they were saying in Cleveland in 1985. Okay. 
Um, all right. So uh, we'll, we'll say this. You, you see commercial real estate could be one very big additional shoe to drop. I I, I, I still kind of put that into the lag effect category. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Because these guys are coming up to refinance and they're just like, oh, my God, my my cost of debt's like more than twice as what it was a year and a half ago. Right. Forget oh, yeah. It. And oh, by the way, the banks are saying, yeah, we need an extra, you know, $10 million of equity, you know, or $100 million of equity, you know, cut us a check or no deal. Right. They don't end it. These guys don't have the equity. Are you kidding me? They're commercial developers. Most of these guys are running 10 times lever, you know, five times yeah. lever. Okay. So big, big potential shoe to drop. All right. Uh, retail housing market. Um, you know, we have mortgage rates over 2X where they were a year and a half ago. Um, we have kind of a frozen market right now, this Mexican standup that you talked about. Um, how do you think it's going to resolve? I mean, it, it's a question of time. It, it, it will resolve down, in my view, if the Fed stays here. Um, because asset prices, I think, will roll over, right? Ultimately, you know, like I had friends, you know, they bought a place down in Florida, I don't know, I guess a year ago, and their broker had told them that, you know, they hadn't, the broker had not done a, a deal with a mortgage on it in like eight months or something. Like it was just all cash all the time. Um, and so that I think, you know, as long as you get asset prices stable, that can go on for a while as, you know, boomers buy their kids houses and stuff, right? Like, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, my wife and I have talked about it where, you know, our oldest son's a senior in college, you know, if he gets out and he goes somewhere, like we're not going to rent, you know, we're, yeah, you know, not that there's anything wrong with rents, but then rents are inflated. So we will subsidize, you know, we'll have rent from us. Why, why would we have rent from somebody else? We have rent from us. We'll buy the house. And then, you know, we'll have them pay the rent to us and rent to own. And we'll however work that out. But I think there's a lot of that going on. You know, again, boomers in the silent generation have 75% of the wealth in this country. And, you know, they've got finite time until they die. They want to have kids, et cetera. Um, I don't think they really care about rates. Hmm. Okay. Um, uh is just the last point on this. So uh, are you concerned about uh, how the extent to which housing could resolve downwards? Like, you know, are we going to be seeing people losing all their equity and that type of stuff? Or do you think it's it's going to be more mild than that? No, I think it's gonna be a lot more mild than that, because I take a look at where the exposure like, and to be clear, I don't think how I don't think housing will resolve downward because I think the government's going to break way sooner, right? Is okay. let's look across the big pools of capital, who has fixed rates and who doesn't, right? Consumers have fixed rates. Corporates have termed their debt out quite a bit. U.S. government hasn't termed it out, and uh, the banks really haven't. So, like you know, I'm making over two points between my mortgage and my money market. Yeah, but that means there's a bank somewhere bleeding two points. And practically speaking, since it's a mortgage, it's effectively the government bleeding and the government's just printing it, right? And so um that's that's the that's the trade-off. So I, I think I don't think the housing market will result down because I think the US government is going to be forced to uh force the Fed into printing money. Uh, to finance the government well before the housing market breaks on the downside because homeowners are locked in at fixed rates because of the installed base of assets that the boomers and the silent generation have to help smooth over for their kids in particular. Um, you know, uh, that's that's how I, that's, I, I th and I like I said, I think we're in the seventh, eighth inning of that. So I think we are T minus a year till the feds has to resume QE or something like that. Okay, okay. Um, all right. And then last and probably greatest area of interest to most of the viewers. All right. So what does all this mean for the financial markets, right? As we as investors are trying to navigate this future that Luke has just laid out is, is likely going to happen here. <clears throat> I've certainly taken from you so far, probably not a fan of bonds, at least not a fan of long duration bonds. Maybe you're a fan of, of short term, you know, U.S. Treasuries just to get the nice, uh, safe uh, T-bill yield. Um, I'm guessing you're pretty bullish on oil, um, mm -hmm. oil related investments. Um, mm -hmm. what, what else do you like and do you not like? Yeah. So I like, 
what we've been talking about for most of this year is a barbell strategy, which is I personally am overweight cash. I'm overweight short-term treasuries. Uh, I am then also overweight gold. I'm overweight Bitcoin. I'm overweight U.S. Uh, electrical infrastructure uh, equities. Um, I am over. Uh, I, I own some energy. Uh, I own I own oil and some oil related equities. Um, and I'm trying to think if there's anything else I'm missing. Um, you know, we've talked about being we, we're still bullish on electrical vehicle related metals, and uh, I own a little silver. Um, but that's. So it's sort of this barbell strategy because I think it's really critical to understand what's happening. People say it's different this time and, and, and they say you should never say it's different this time, but mm -hmm. it actually is on some levels different this time by the, by the scale and order of magnitude. And like, if someone tells you they know exactly how things are going to go over the next 12 months, run, like run in the other direction because yeah. like I'm as, you know, as deep in all this is, and I can, I could see very clear to, you know, yeah. Could we get a deflationary crash? Sure. Do I think it will last very long? It better not. Um, and that's why I want that cash in those short-term treasuries. Right. Um, you know, because I want to have some liquidity. I want to have, you know, some, some optionality. Uh, I have zero conviction in sort of the very short-term how it could play out. I have extremely high conviction and how it will ultimately play out, which is the Fed's going to have to print the money to finance the government. And it's going to be very inflationary for a sustained period of time. Uh, it will probably be explicit yield curve control in the United States. And bondholders who have won no matter what for 40 straight years are going to lose no matter what on a real basis for probably 10 years. I mean, People forget that the average real rate on bonds was negative from 1900 until 1981. And then it was positive, and everyone's like, oh, bonds, bonds, blah, blah, blah. Great. Right. And then it was massively negative in 2022. It's negative again. So um, I think, you know, for me, long duration, and in particular, Western sovereign bonds, I, had, I don't know why you'd be involved. Uh, I don't know why you'd be involved. You know, what would change my mind if the U.S. came out and said we're going to cut 40, 60 percent entitlements, 40, right. 60 percent of defense tomorrow permanently. We're bringing the boys home. Sorry, boomers. You got enough money. Move on. OK, now you're now you're speaking my language. I could I could I could buy long term treasuries at, at, at whatever. Where are we at? Four point three in the tenure. But otherwise, like, are you kidding me? Why? You know, it's, it's as a good friend of mine in business, <laughs> like it's blood sport. Like, great. You know, we're going to trade them. Have fun. But it's, you know, why take 4.3 on 10 years when you can get five on short term? Makes no sense to me. Got it. Got it. And so presumably your gold and your Bitcoin holdings there are really the play against the Fed getting forced to, to print. Yeah, I think those two will be the best, the best. And I think gold is a derivative energy play because. Again, it takes, the it takes energy it, to get it out of the ground. Yeah. That's exactly it. And and you can't, you know, if we're in peak cheap oil, as I think we are, as the evidence increasingly suggests we are, you can't, treasuries can no longer be the primary reserve asset. And so the question is, what's the next primary reserve asset? And, and all other candidates out there, with the exception of gold, either cannot be or do not want it, right? So the pound can't have it, the yen can't have it. Uh, Euro and Yuan do not want that uh, uh, exorbitant privilege that turns into an exorbitant burden, and you're left with gold. Okay. And you can see central banks buying gold. You can, and they've been doing so for nine years. They bought more treasure. They bought more gold than treasuries in the last nine years. Okay, I, I'm just asking this because I'm sure there's going to be comments beneath this video asking about it. If I don't, um, thoughts then on this this uh, purported new BRICS currency that's going to be a basket of commodities priced in gold. Um, any general thoughts, but but would that be a favorable commodity if it indeed were launched, given the reasons that you're just talking about there? I don't think they're going to launch any sort of separate currency. I think what they're ultimately going to do is uh, agree uh, that gold buys more commodities in their block than it does in London and New York. 
And then they'll just stand back and let free markets do the rest, which is to say, if Russia, China, and Iran all agree that an ounce of gold by 60 barrels of oil in the BRICS block in Shanghai and Moscow, and it's only 30 barrels an ounce in the heavily paper Western markets in the UK and in New York, every hedge fund on the planet is going to say, okay, I'm going to short 30 barrels of oil in London or New York. I'm going to take the cash proceeds. I'm going to buy an ounce of gold, take the ounce of gold to the BRICS block. I'm going to get 60 barrels of oil from the Russians and the Iranians and anyone else participating. I will then sell 30 barrels, cover my short in London or New York. I'll get 33 barrels. I can then sell. Washman's repeat, risk-free arbitrage, what could possibly go wrong. And of course, what can possibly go wrong is New York and London get cleaned out of gold inventories remarkably fast, declare force majeure, <laughs> and the BRICS will have just used their oil to devalue the dollar against gold by half. And that's some version of that. Do I think that's coming this week? Probably not. Do I think that's where the world is heading? Yeah. Why do I think that? Because in 08, when Russia started buying gold for the reserves, uh, an ounce of gold bought eight barrels of oil, 10 barrels of oil. Now it's 30. That number, I think, is going, it has gone up. I think it will continue to go up over time. All right, great. I'd love to delve into that a little more deeply, but <laughs> folks, we don't have time. Luke has been so generous in giving us an hour and a half now, folks. Um, well, Luke, thanks. It's always wonderful having you on the program. It's always a very intellectual discussion. Um, it's always a very fascinating discussion. Thank you for coming back on, my friend. Um, for folks that have enjoyed this discussion, and for the few who maybe this was the first time they've gotten introduced to you and your work, where can people follow you and your work in the future? Sure. Yeah, they can check out our website, fftt-llc.com. Uh, they can also check out Twitter feed uh, at Luke Groman, L-U-K-E-G-R-O-M-E-N. All right, great. And Luke, when we edit this, I will put the URLs to those up on the screen so folks will know awesome. clearly where to go. Folks will also put links in the description to the video below. Um, just in wrapping up here real quickly, folks, obviously, that is a very murky, mercurial, highly volatile future that uh, Luke has, has laid out for us here. Certainly to have lots of twists and turns, surprises for all of us. I'm sure Luke would even say himself, he said, you know, these things are really hard to predict, uh, especially in the shorter time frames. Um, so as usual, I'm just going to reiterate, we highly recommend that uh, viewers here uh, work under the guidance of a, of a good professional financial advisor in crafting a personalized portfolio plan that takes into account all of the issues that Luke has been talking about here. And I'll tell you, they're really, it's a small minority of financial advisors out there that do. So make sure you find you know an advisor that does take all that stuff into account. If you've got a good one who's doing all this for you, great, stick with them. They are quite rare. If you don't, or you'd like a second opinion from one who does, consider scheduling a free consultation with the financial advisors that Wealthion endorses. To do that, just fill out the short form at wealthion.com. Only takes you a couple of seconds. Totally free to have these uh, discussions with them. Uh, there's no commitment to work with these guys. It's just a free public service they offer to help as many people as possible, uh, as many people position as prudently as possible in advance of the things that, that Luke thinks may be coming down the road for all the reasons that he discussed here. Um, if you enjoyed having Luke on this program, would like to have him come back on, please vote your support for that by hitting the like button, then clicking on the red subscribe button below, as well as that little bell icon right next to it. Luke, I want to thank you again. I'll give you the last word here. Any parting bits of advice for the viewers? No, I think it's really just critical to uh, be conservatively levered uh, or unlevered, uh, in which case, you know, I think that goes a long way in, in helping people uh, not just survive, but prosper in the volatility that I think is unfortunately probably going to be a feature uh, in coming years. All right. Thanks so much, Luke, again. Just a wonderful time. Really appreciate you giving us so much time. Everyone else, thanks so much for watching.